Good morning. Uh, this morning's scripture is found in Mark chapter 13, verses 28 to 37, on page number 850 in the Bibles under the chairs in front of you. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servant in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Nice to see you all here. Um, I've never uh, been to England before. Maybe some of you have. Maybe some of you have visited there before. Never been there, but uh, they tell me that if you go and visit the UK, that one of the things you have to do is check out uh, Buckingham Palace. And, of course, you don't go there to visit with the Queen. Uh, that probably wouldn't work out for you. Uh, you don't go there even to see the building. Uh, you go to Buckingham Palace to see these guards. And maybe you guys have seen these before. Um, these, these guards that uh, stand and uh, wait and watch. And uh, just for a minute, can you um, imagine this job that they have uh, standing at attention for hours, right? Not responding to any type of jokes or having to sneeze or moving a, a muscle or uh, dealing with those thousands of uh, tourists that come through and try to just even get them to move uh, for a minute. And, you know, just to be honest, you guys, maybe some of you have the ability to do something like that. I, I would not be able to do this. I mean, uh, with years of training, being in the best a physical condition of my life under hypnosis. I could not do this. I would screw it up somehow. Um, and, you know, it, it just, it would be very difficult for me. And, and, of course, they do it for a purpose, right? They, they have a job to do. They stand uh, guard uh, to, to protect the queen, right, for God and for country. And it's all very British, right? And uh, it's, it's, there's a purpose behind it. And some people you know, think that, well, they're, it's just part of the decor, right? They're kind of these rent a cops or with fake, fake weapons. And, you know, I, I warn you, these guys are trained to kill. In fact, if you, um, uh, if, if you want to see something kind of funny, just go on YouTube and type in, you know, Buckingham Palace Guards. There's guys that are, just go off on some of these tourists that just kind of cross the line a little too far. Um, so they have a purpose in mind. And so it, it would take an incredible amount of discipline to pull off a job like this, all right? I mean, just going to uh, your shift and realizing you have to put all your own personal stuff aside for that six-hour shift or whatever it is and just realize, man, I, I can't react emotionally. I have to just stand here and, and do my job. And so in the same way as you just heard uh, read, uh, we have an opportunity to look at a passage this morning where Jesus uh, is challenging us to do the same thing, to, to keep guard, to stay awake, uh, to make sure that we're, we're keeping watch. And he's asking us to be patient. He's asking us to persevere uh, through this life as we look towards the life to come. And so with our time together, I want to look at this parable um, that this passage starts off with, and we're going to use this parable as kind of a, a, a way to look back and review uh, what we've, kind of the conversation we've been in, and also to springboard forward, um, you know, what it, what it means to wait in the meantime. And so hopefully, as we look at this passage, we're going to see how it challenges us, uh, how we're supposed to live until that day that we've all been waiting for, since the day we were created. So let's dig right in. Uh, verse 28 with this parable, and if, if you're new to church, um, first of all, welcome. But a parable, uh, a parable is simply a story with a point. 
And uh, Jesus would speak in parables quite often. He would use parables as a way to draw the audience in, as opposed to just preaching the answers and kind of giving us the answers right off the bat. He would use parables to, to help us um, and, and kind of invite us on a journey with him. So uh, verse 28, he told him this parable. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. And so if you've been with us here in Mark for a while, um, likelihood is, is that you've been in Mark with us for a while, because we've been in Mark for a while, uh, but you realize this, this parable about this fig tree, it's not a new uh, idea, right? Everywhere that Jesus walked around, um, there were fig trees, and so he would use them quite often as examples. And so the imagery he's trying to pull up here is this imagery of the fig tree, which is barren of leaves for most of the year all up until the summer months start coming. And so as the summer months start, start to arrive, you know that it's summertime because the fig tree will start to have more, uh, more leaves on it and it'll start to bloom a little bit. And um, of course, this example is a little bit lost on us, on us as Southern Californians because we have zero seasons, right? So just there's no idea when uh, a season's gonna start. But it's a, an example that the disciples would understand and they would see that, okay, when the tree, when the tree starts to come in, in full bloom, then we know that summer's coming. So he continues on uh, in verse uh, 29. It says, So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. And so as Pastor Chris mentioned last week, did a great job laying out the argument that basically these things, everything that's happened in chapter 13 from verse 3 all the way up to this point, uh, he's basically saying all this stuff has to do with the experience that the disciples have had in their lifetime and will have just a few years later. So this isn't thousands of years in the future. This, this has to do with you know, the wars and the, the famines and the persecutions that the disciples will see in their lifetime, the destruction of the temple, things like that. And so he's saying when you see these things take place, just in the same way as when you see the, the fig tree start to get leaves on it, you know that he's coming. Um, one of the synoptics, Luke uh, chapter 21, tells the same story And he adds this phrase, and he says, when these things happen, you'll know that the kingdom of God is near. And so I just want to talk about this for a minute, the kingdom of God. And this is is a concept, uh, quite frankly, it's a little mysterious, it's a little little bit something that people will debate about sometimes, you know, what is the kingdom of God? And, you know, quite simply, a kingdom, a kingdom is simply the reign of a king. And so as we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the reign of the king, King Jesus, and his reign. And so we see in scripture that the kingdom of God is something that um, is, is, is already started in that Jesus has come already, but it's not yet because we're waiting for that prophecy to be fulfilled in his second coming. You see, it's, it's started because he's, he's come, it's advancing, he has a few followers, uh, he's gaining steam, but at the same time, it's not completed yet because he hasn't come back yet. Um, and so the heavens and, and the earth, when he comes back, everything will be remade new, everything will change, there'll be no death or despair or sin or destruction, and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And so it's already in that it starts with him, but it won't be completed until it comes back. So as thinking about this concept of a kingdom, um, I have to be honest with you guys, I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to uh, science fiction and fantasy stuff. Um, so I just want to you know, confess that at church. But I, I think about, uh, you know, Narnia. I think about Lord of the Rings and Middle Earth. When I think about this kingdom concept, and uh, please don't judge me, and the, this idea of, you know, what is a kingdom? And so, I, you know, if you've read those books, if you've seen those types of movies, you think about uh, Aragorn, right? And so Aragorn, he's, I've lost like a third of you, but uh, Aragorn is this guy who's got royal blood, and people uh, don't quite recognize him right away because he's taken on this different identity. He has a different name. He hides out in the shadows. But as soon as people recognize him, as soon as they see and recognize that oh, he's the guy, they follow him immediately. And they know, it's like, man, this guy is, is royalty. He's the rightful king. And so as the story progresses, you know that uh, Aragorn uh, eventually takes on more responsibility. He starts to lead um, 
uh, lead battles. He's like the general of the, of the, of the battle of the, of the armies. And eventually, at the end of the story, he's crowned king of all men of Middle Earth. I am a nerd. Okay, so there, there's this concept out there in pop culture, right? I mean, you see it all the time, uh, whether it's Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or, or whatever. Uh, but Jesus is the king, right? He showed up. He established his kingdom And it's a starting place for him, and he's uh, kind of accumulating followers as as time goes on. And in the meantime, uh, where we are today, it is now our job, it's our role to continue to advance his kingdom um, through us as disciples of Jesus Christ. And so this is our role today. And so uh, Jesus starts with this parable, and he's, he's simply saying, look, when you see these signs, all of these signs that have happened from verse 3 all the way up to verse 27, when you've seen all these signs, you know that the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom is near, that I'm coming soon. And so every moment it gets closer. By the way, we don't sit around and obsess about that day right? Uh, Chris talked about this a few weeks ago. We're much more of a, uh, a planning committee as opposed to, I'm sorry, much more of a welcoming committee as opposed to a planning committee. Uh, we're much more thinking about, man, how do we get ourselves ready? Not thinking and obsessing about the day that he's coming. Because scripture promises that if we do, uh, we'll, we'll be wrong. So there's no use to it. So we long for that day. We eagerly uh, prepare our hearts and anticipate that day that he returns. And this is kind of our, our role. We want to see Jesus come back. Uh, verse 31, he moves on and he talks more about his, his promises and how they never change. Look at verse 31. It says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And so he's, he's basically bringing attention to the character and the nature of his word, of scripture, and he's saying that, look, my words will never pass away. Uh, These huge mountains and these vast oceans and these rivers and lakes and this whole area, all of this stuff will will be dirt and dust before my words uh, pass away. This is how sure my promise is. And so this is what he's he's saying here. And so uh, this is the, the story, the illustration that Jesus starts with. And he's using um, this, this illustration as kind of a springboard into the next thing. And he's gonna, he's gonna take our attention and focus, and he's gonna shift our perspective uh, from what has already happened in famines, in uh, wars, in the destruction of the temple, to what is going to happen even for us still. Uh, and we don't know when that's going to happen. But verse 32, he, he, he kind of changes the perspective here. This is a challenge. Uh, verse 32, but concerning that day or hour, again, now he's talking about the second coming, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. And so, you know, thinking about this portion of the passage this past week, um, you know, I think... When it comes to Jesus' return, uh, there's kind of two extremes, okay? So there's this, this one extreme where people just harp on and think about, man, when's he coming? When's the date? It could be at any moment. They're thinking about, you know, this, this concept, and it really kind of freaks them out a little bit. And there's not that many of you out there who think this way, but you're very weird if you do. Um, and uh, I was thinking about my, my dad. My dad became a Christian in the 60s. And it was during this whole Jesus movement time. And I remember him telling me about how um, he became a Christian during that time. Maybe you guys remember that time. Um, and, and it was this weird time where people would um, just be thinking, oh, he's going to come at any point. Jesus is going to come back at any point. And so they didn't get married when they probably should have. Uh, they didn't have kids when they probably should have. They didn't buy houses because they're like, what's the point? All right, Jesus is going to come back at any point. So there's, there's some of those folks that are on this end of the spectrum, and there's some of you guys who I think while you're probably very good planners, 
and you're thinking about, hey, how do I leave an inheritance for my kids or take care of my grandkids? There's not many of you who, who think about uh, your fifth, sixth, seventh generation down the road. It's just not a normal thing, right? And you're not over here either. And where I think most of us are this morning, at least I know for myself, is whatever's the most important thing in our life at that moment, right? Whatever is kind of right in front of our face, whatever uh, current project we're working on, whether it's a family issue or uh, an issue at home or uh, whatever that is, that tends to take all of our attention. That's the most important thing to us. And so maybe it's the, the latest achievement that we need to get done or the, the latest milestone. Or, or maybe we're focused on the worldly pleasures that are around us. And so we're thinking about, man, when is Friday night coming, right? We're just working for the weekend. Or when's my next vacation? Because I cannot stand this job any longer. And so you're thinking about, you know, just looking towards the next thing. Um, you know, I'll be honest, with this past week even, um, our church staff, a few of us got together for, for lunch, and we're just trying to figure out where to go to lunch. I think it was on Tuesday, and uh, maybe you guys can relate to this, but we just like sat around for like 15 minutes, like, where are we going to lunch? Where are we going to lunch? And we just talked about this for like a long time. And at one point, I was like, I think jokingly, I think, I said, guys, let's just figure this out because this is the highlight of my whole day. Please just, you know, <laughs> lunch is important here. And we're just so, I mean, we're so caught up in the temporary, Right? And just whatever is right in front of our face at the time. And so I think that's what dominates our thoughts, right? We're not over here when it comes to when Jesus is coming back tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning. We're not over here when we're thinking about how do we plan for five or six generations down the line. We're thinking about, man, how, how do I get through today, right? How do I deal with what's in front of me right now? And the reality is, it's not always bad things. A lot of times, they're very just normal things. Because, you know, people move, and they have to find a new house. Uh, people have to find new jobs. Sometimes there's, uh, there's people in, in the part of the family that get sick, and so you have to take care of their needs. Or you have a college student who, who wrecked the car again, you know? It's just, there's these things that come up in life, and they're not bad things. They're morally neutral things that just take up a lot of our time. Uh, just this past couple of weeks, I was in the process of, of trying to sell our family vehicle and, uh, and buy a, a replacement vehicle. And man, it, you'd think it would be a simple thing, but you know, you're, it takes a while. And you're thinking about that stuff all the time. And it just takes up your, your thoughts. And so here's what happens, though. When we get so caught up in the now... When we get so caught up in what's happening to us and how I respond to those things in the now, what ends up happening is, is these things just kind of build on top of one another. And depending on your personality, uh, maybe you're like me, maybe you're, maybe you're a little bit OCD and driven, and so you end up just putting your head down and just kind of trying to get it done on your own, and you end up stressing out or you end up you know, lashing out to your family in anger or something. And it's just not the way we're, we're wired. We're supposed to do things. And if we're not careful, what we can also be doing here is building our own kingdom and kind of building this, this culture around your friends, around your family that's very unhealthy because you're celebrating just achievements, and you're celebrating getting these things done off this list, or you're celebrating this works-based spirituality. That's not biblical whatsoever. And so Jesus is saying here, look, when we're consumed by these details, the other danger is you might just miss him. You might miss Jesus. And, and man, I encourage you guys, don't miss Jesus. Man, he could have come back in the flesh like two weeks ago, and I would have been too busy because I had my nose in Craigslist, right? And Craigslist is not worth missing Jesus over. I mean, so Jesus could come back like literally, and we would miss him because we're busy with life, or figuratively because we're missing what he's doing in us and all around us. And, and so this is the, this is the, the danger that we, we have in front of us. So what are we looking towards? We're looking towards uh, that day, right? We're looking towards the day that he returns in all his glory when everything changes. So the, with the rest of our time, I want to answer the question, what do we do in the meantime? How do we live this life? Um, how are we supposed to go through the day-to-day the, the -day 
grind? You know, how are we supposed to get through it? And so looking at this passage, uh, there are four things that kind of stuck out to me in the text I want to share with you. <coughs> and if we do these things, I believe it'll help us, it'll equip us to push back against that human tendency just to do whatever we're doing in that present moment, that kind of short-term mindset. Uh, so how do we live in the now? Um, number one, the first thing we do is we pray. I know it's a very church answer, but let me explain this. We pray. In verses 34 to 37, Jesus uh, uses this example, right? He, he talks about how there's this house whose master leaves, and the servants uh, don't know when he's coming back, but they're supposed to get all the stuff done in the meantime, and so there's this desperate plea to stay awake. It's kind of the theme of that passage. Stay awake. Keep guard. Stay awake. It could be at any moment. So where do we muster up that kind of strength? Man, you know, if we already know that some of us have been there, done that, and tried to do that on our own, and if we look at the example of Jesus, Jesus himself, he withdraws, he prays, and he does this all the time throughout his ministry. And so he challenges us to do the same thing, to withdraw and to pray. Um, remember, man, if you'd step back just for a minute, remember where Jesus is in Mark. We're on the home stretch because he's in the final week of his ministry here on earth. And so, uh, do you remember in freshman English class, we talk about, you know, how stories and uh, setting is so important for characters? Uh, where is Jesus at this moment? Uh, at, the, at the final week of his life, he's sitting on this hill called the Mount of Olives, and he's just hanging out with his guys. He's just talking, and they get really deep in some things, and they talk about some very serious issues. But at the end of the day, he's just talking to his friends. They're talking to, to their rabbi. And they're just living life together. And so if you knew, if I knew, like Jesus did, that this is, this is my last week here on earth, you know, how would you be spending it? And I think we can learn a lot from how Jesus spent his time, his last week here on earth. Man, would you, would you have some parties? Would you hang out with friends? Would you have some great meals? And Jesus does some of that, but what he also does is we see over and over again is he withdraws from the, the craziness of everyday life, and he prays, and he spends time um, getting rejuvenated. <clears throat> and so I want to camp here just for a few minutes on this concept of prayer, because Foothill, I'm not sure if we are the best uh, praying church. I can be honest with you guys, I'm not the best praying Christian or pastor. This is something that, um, man, I'm... I'm still working on myself, and it's, it's hard to do. But I think oftentimes we, even as the church, unfortunately, can become a reflection of the culture around us. And so we, as a culture, are very driven. We're very uh, task-oriented. We want to get things done, which in a lot of ways is admirable. But as so often is the case, our greatest strength can be our greatest weakness, and so what ends up happening is we take up all these things on our own back and, and we try to build our own kingdom up. And I don't think that prayer necessarily solves all of that. It's not some kind of special spell, spell you put on, over it or anything like that, but it's one of the key things. And we see it consistently in Jesus' life. Uh, Jesus says this in John 15, 5. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so what Jesus is saying here is that nothing worth doing can ever happen apart from Jesus. If you read uh, John 15 sometime, if you haven't read it, I encourage you guys to do so. It's a great passage. And uh, Jesus says, 11 times, depending on your translation, either abide or remain. And he says it over and over and over again. And the whole point is, is you, can't, you can't accomplish anything. There will be no fruit in your life unless you do it with me. And so this is what Jesus is challenging us. And, and so through prayer, when we take time to pray, when we take time to set our, our needs in front of the Heavenly Father and say, man, help me with this. I can't do this on my own. Uh, what we're doing is we're, we're bending our, our mission and our vision and our priorities back to his just for a time. You know, I think prayer, as I've been, you know, thinking more about this, 
Prayer is a declaration of war on self-centeredness, on selfish living, on that whole, you know, living whatever's in front of your face at that moment kind of thing. Um, You know, I've been trying to journal a little bit about prayer, which is kind of ironic because that's what people do who are convicted about not doing something you're supposed to do. You journal and, and read books about stuff. And so that's where I've been. And the more I read about it, the more I think about prayer, um, man, the more I realize that's so true, this, that prayer is, is a declaration of war. And uh, I came across this list that I thought was helpful. Um, I might post it online at some point, but listen to this list. Um, number one, prayer is a declaration of war on self-sufficiency as we become more and more dependent on God. It's a war on independence because you have to admit you can't do it alone. It's a war on self-importance as you praise something greater than yourself. It's a declaration of war on anxiety as you trust that God will provide. It's a war on the temporary pleasures that the world has to offer us as we praise the giver of all gifts. It's a declaration of war on justification by results as you have to acknowledge that it's God who works in you. It's a declaration of war on cynicism and unbelief as we step out in faith that he hears and he answers. And so I'm convinced that apart from prayer, apart from uh, withdrawing from the stresses of this life to pray about it, um, man, we will be stuck. We'll be stuck in that mentality of, man, whatever is the next project, whatever is my current you know, issue, that's going to be the most important thing in the universe unless we pray about it. And it's really through prayer that we can combat those things. That's the first thing, prayer. Number two, we also worship. We worship, and we see this through the respect that the employees have for their employer, uh, that these servants have for the master. And we see this in uh, verse 35. Let me turn there, verse 35. It says, therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. So you might have to read between the lines here a little bit, but you get the message. The servants don't want to be found asleep, right? They realize if they do, there will be consequences, and this is not an ideal situation. So they want to stay awake. They want to make sure that they're awake And we have a God who deserves the same type of reverence and respect and worship. And so we worship him. That should be part of what we're doing in this lifetime. And just as a clarification, we worship uh, God, the giver, the creator, not the gifts or the creation. Uh, Romans 1 clarifies this and warns us. uh, It says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is supposed to be praised. And so what we end up doing oftentimes in in our culture is we end up worshiping much more often the the created thing. And so food or drink or sex, and we, we, we worship these gifts, these good things as God things, and we try to use them as fulfillment in our life. And man, I'm not saying for a minute that these things are bad, right? Food and drink and sex. I'm just saying that God has given us these things to enjoy to his glory, right? According to his rules. And so we enjoy beer, we enjoy wine, but we don't get drunk. We enjoy sex and have a great sex life in the confines of a holy marriage. We enjoy food. Some of us enjoyed food a lot this week, right? I know I did. We enjoy food, but we don't worship it. I mean, I've, I'm pretty sure I've worshipped a burrito before. I just, it's just part of who I am. We, wor- we don't worship food, but it's a, it's a preview, right? It's a preview of the wedding feast in what, which one day we'll, we'll meet with Jesus face to face. And that's the whole point of the gifts that God has given us, especially in a place like Southern California where we live. We have to fight this mentality a lot. Because there are marketing firms out there whose sole job it is to make sure that we think as a consumer that these things are the ultimate in experiences, right? And so we have some awesome, you know, food and entertainment options where we live here. But for as, 
for us as Christians, we have to remember what's important. And we have to remember that we worship the creator and the giver of those gifts as opposed to the gifts themselves. Number three, we also steward everything for the kingdom. We steward everything for the kingdom. Verse 34, it is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. And so we aren't just called to hang out in the meantime. Um, man, we're, we have responsibilities. We have things that have been given to us that we are going to be held accountable for how we used our time and our money and our resources and all, all the things that we have been given. And so with our money, with our resources, um, there's, there's kind of this lie versus reality thing going on. The great lie, this thing that we've all bought into, a lot of us have anyway, is this illusion that we have stuff, right? We have stuff, and God wants some of that stuff back. And so if we're good Christians, we'll give some of it back, and then we'll do good things with the rest of it. That's a lie. Because the reality is, the reality is, is that you and I have nothing, we have nothing, and all that we have been given for this life temporarily has just been given on loan. It's just been given to us by God, and so at any point, he can take that stuff and use it if he sees fit. And so we have to realize this, this, all, this means all of our time, all of our abilities, every relationship we have, every resource we have, it's a, it's a precious resource, and we're supposed to steward it towards advancing the kingdom of God. So uh, thinking about even just examples of this, man, one of my favorite old hymns, um, it's called My God, My Father, and there's a couple lines in there that says, If thou should call me to resign what most I prize, never was mine. I only yield thee what is thine. And so we've only been entrusted uh, what God has given us. Uh, that's all we have. And so this is, a, this is a powerful implication for the rest of our life. And I hope we realize this isn't just about our time and our money and our, our resources. This goes down into who we are as people, our identity, right, our, our, how we see ourselves. And so I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you that you are not your gifts. You are not your abilities and you are not your stage in life. Uh, what I mean by that is God did not put you on this earth to be an artist. He didn't. It's just, we have a lot of artists probably in the world, and he, he didn't put you here to just draw and paint. Uh, God puts you on this earth to be an image-bearing, God-glorifying disciple of Jesus on mission to make more disciples who happens to be entrusted with certain artistic abilities. And you're supposed to use those abilities to advance his kingdom. That's how we should see our giftings and our talents. And so it's, it means every dollar, every moment, every relationship, even every stage of life. So if you're a mom, you're not just put on this earth to be a mom to the kids you have. You're called to be an image-bearing, God-glorifying disciple of Jesus Christ who has been entrusted with these kids to make disciples of all for the purpose of advancing the kingdom of God. That is your role. That is your, your true identity. And so you're not your gifting. You're not your roles. You're a steward. We are stewards. It doesn't matter where you're at in life. Uh, we use what we have to advance the kingdom. And when we really begin to see our life uh, through this lens, I'm convinced it will change the way that we live. It has to. So that's number three, is, is we steward. Number four, lastly, we anticipate. We anticipate. And so the main theme of this whole passage, stay awake, right? Stay awake. Uh, keep guard. Make sure that you're understanding the, the timeline you're in. So we eagerly anticipate. There's a sense of urgency when it comes to how we live our lives today. And, and Foothill, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know when Jesus will return. None of us do but he promises that he will return. And so, uh, you know, I think what he's telling us here today is that we're supposed to live each day as if it were our last. And so, you know, 
if Jesus came back, what would we have to show for it? What would we have to show for it? And I'm not trying to manipulate you or, or you know, try to encourage you towards a works-based spirituality. I'm not saying that at all, but I think on the flip side, a lot of us land on the other side of this where we're just like, man, you know, I got all the time in the world. It's not a big deal. It's not, you know, I can deal with that relationship issue later. I can deal with my finances later. I can get out of debt later. Whatever the issue may be, and we've completely disconnected it from how we anticipate Jesus coming back at any moment. And so he says, stay awake. Stay awake. And he doesn't just say this because he wants us to, to, to do it for, for our health. He, he's telling us to stay awake because he wants to do something in us and through us in the meantime. So if we don't do these things, if we don't, if we don't pray, if we don't worship, if we don't steward our resources, and if we don't stay awake and anticipate his return, uh, we are in real danger of missing Jesus. Don't miss Jesus. This story continues, and you can keep reading if you like, and um, we'll cover this in about a month. But as you know, Jesus is in the garden. He's back in the garden, and he's, uh, he knows that it's just a few moments, a few minutes until he's, he's captured, he's, uh, he, he's uh, tortured, um, and he dies on that cross. And so he's there with his guys, and he tells the disciples the same thing that he would tell us today, and simply to watch and pray that you won't fall into temptation. Just watch and pray. And Jesus is just a few feet away from the disciples. He's agonizing, and he's completely stressed out, and he's thinking about all that God the Father has given him to do. And he's, he's sweating blood, and, and he's just completely stressed out. And uh, he comes back on more than one occasion to his disciples, and what are they doing? They're asleep. And like us today, just completely thinking about the temporary. Man, I've had a long day. Uh, I've, you know, I've been up early this morning. I got stuff to do later. I need a nap. And so they're just sleeping. They're just thinking about, you know, how they're feeling at the time, and they don't understand, even though Jesus has, has said over and over again that it would happen this way, that he'd be captured, he would, he would die on a cross, he would ra be rise, raised again in three days, uh, they don't understand the part in the story that they're in. And so they've missed it. They miss Jesus in this moment. And we do the same thing when we simply obsess over what's right in front of us, when we start thinking about uh, whatever we have to do next. And guys, this is honestly convicting for me too. I mean, maybe you guys are, are busy people. I mean, we're all busy. And there are things in your life that have gone up on the priority list uh, way ahead of your relationship with the Lord. And so just think about these things. And as we withdraw to pray, think about these things. As we worship God, the, the, the giver of these gifts, not the creation, but the giver of these gifts, and as we steward our resources towards that end, we, we anticipate his coming in a biblical way, in a healthy way. You see, honestly, I'm much more comfortable um, talking about the kingdom of God advancing. I'm much more comfortable talking about that through some great church program, uh, through Foothill Church on the weekends or, or whatever they may be. And, and as I think more about this, as I pray more about this, as God challenges me and convicts me, I realize that the kingdom of God advancing, it starts with my own heart. And it starts with your, your heart. And it has to start there because if it doesn't, then we can't just rely on programs or a building or a, a church to do that. And, and luckily for us, fortunately for us, there is grace. There's, there's grace that Jesus offers us. And it's not a cheap grace where he says, it's cool, no problem, we're, we're fine. Because that's the kind of grace that you and I offer each other so often. It's this grace that transforms our heart. It realigns us back on vision with him. And so Jesus stands before us today. And don't for a minute think that he's talking to someone else. He's talking to you. And he's, he's there 
uh, remember the setting. Remember, he's in the temple talking to disciples. He's talking to us today. And so and he's not saying, you know, I did it, right? I did it. Just try harder. We have a Savior who was the ultimate example. And so we look to him, and his life gives us that standard in which we're trying for. We'll never reach, but he gives us a new heart. And he says, if, you, if we draw near to him, our priorities, our vision, everything will change. And so, friends, keep guard, stay awake, and do not miss Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Father, that's our prayer. Uh, we want to see you. We want to see what you're doing in us and around us. And Lord, we pray that, that we would be an active participant in that. We would not uh, be in a place where we've missed it because we're so burdened down by just what's happening in our life at a certain time. God, I pray for our priorities. I pray that as we live our life, even this, this new week coming up, God, God, that we would find time to withdraw in prayer. We would spend time in your word, meditating, worshiping you, Lord. God, we ask that you would help us, give us wisdom when it comes to stewarding our resources, realizing, man, it's all yours. Everything I am is yours. Even where I'm at in life, it's all yours. And God, I pray it would all just create in us this excitement and this anticipation for your return. Lord, we pray that you would come quickly. This life uh, has a lot of trouble. It's, there's a lot of issues that people are dealing with in this room, Lord. And so we ask that you would come quickly, that we would see your glory. But in the meantime, Lord, help us live wisely. Give us a passion for you. Give us a passion for the lost in our community, in our, in our homes, in our schools, in our, our workplaces, Lord. Change our hearts. We love you, God. We pray this all in your name. Amen.